be in Galatians chapter 4 today. Galatians 4. So, you guys remember Cinderella? Yep. She was all but a slave to her stepmother and stepsisters until she met Prince Charming, right? Sleeping Beauty was enslaved to a curse until her rescuer gave her a kiss. Rapunzel was enslaved in a tower. Snow White was cursed. Fiona was cursed. That's from Shrek. You don't know. All right. All these enslaved women were trapped in something, waiting for the hero to come and save them. But, you know, Aladdin, he was under a curse too, right? He was a street rat. Enslaved to the streets, which is his own type of slavery, until he met the genie. That helped him. Ultimate rags to riches story. You know, if, if you go through the fairy tales of, of our history, you know, we have this common theme that there is somebody that is without hope, somebody that is trapped, somebody that is enslaved, and they're just waiting for the hero to come. Now, in real life, the hero doesn't come, right? So in all these stories, there must be some type of supernatural thing, a fairy godmother or, you know, a giant green ogre and a talking donkey, you know, some type of genie or something like that, something out of the ordinary. You know, you wonder what, why do they have this common theme? And I believe that, you know, our stories as, as people, they go back to the original story and they steal elements from the original story. You know, a story still being written today, you know, a, uh, an original rescue story, a story authored by God himself of which all of you are a character. And that's still being written. It's not done today. It's the story of the gospel. The gospel at its heart is a rescue story. It is a story of slaves being freed and much more. And in Galatians right now, Paul is, is writing a letter to these churches he planted that have misunderstood the gospel. He's like, you missed something. People come along and they muddied the water and they led you astray. And now you're beginning to confuse the gospel with something else entirely. Something inaccurate that's not the gospel at all. He's like, because you've got to get this one thing right. You have to understand the truth of the gospel. So right now, you know, as we've been going through, he's argued and, and tried to teach them. And he's used Old Testament prophecies and Old Testament verses to explain to them. But now he's going to give them a basic story. An amazing illustration that breaks down what has happened to us, what God is trying to do in the gospel, and it's in Galatians chapter 4. <coughs> in my Greek 3 class, you know, I had to take a year of Greek in seminary, and I had to write on this passage for my paper. It took all semester. It was over 30 pages long, you know that? And all I thought of is one day I'm not going to write a paper on this passage. I'm going to talk to real human beings about it. It is so much more fun to talk about the gospel than to write a technical paper about it. So, you guys are in for a treat today, okay? This is great. I'm not going to talk about any Greek stuff. Nothing at all. It's going to be amazing, okay? Here we go. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. He says, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. So Paul starts off by saying, you know, in the Roman household, whether you were a slave or a child really didn't matter because you had no rights until the father said so. He's like, and you know, all of us in the same way, he's like, we were all enslaved to something. We were all in bondage to the elementary things of the world. The elementary principles of the world. We're all in bondage. We're all enslaved. Now, that may say, sound strange to our ears that we were slaves before Christ. So we're like, well, no, we weren't. No, we weren't. Slavery was done away with, right? Um, we're Americans. We're not slaves. You know, when Jesus first called people slaves, they said the exact same thing. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. Which is ironic, right? Because the people of Israel were enslaved to Egypt. That's their whole story. But they're like, we were never slaves. It's also ironic because they were literally slaves of the Roman Empire, a conquered people. Yet these people looked at Jesus and say, we ain't slaves. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Now, the slave does not remain in the house forever. 
The Son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus said that all who commit sins are slaves of sin. This is a spiritual slavery. Now, a lot of us think of sin, here's a good way to think about it. Think of it like an addiction. You know, if somebody is addicted to a substance, you know, if they're a drug addict, we know that when that addiction calls them, they have to answer. They might fight it for a little while, but they answer it. And we understand that as a form of slavery. You know, if somebody's an alcoholic, they may try to do away with it, do away with it, but when it calls them, eventually they're drawn to it and they answer. We recognize that as a form of slavery. Maybe addicted to gambling. You know, my grandfather, man, he liked the horses. He loved the horses. He loved the horses till the day he died. I remember he would get his check, his social security check, and my aunt would take it and pay the bills and give him the rest, and he would take it and go to the horses. And he had bad luck, too. Bad luck. My mom told me one day he came home, put it all on this one horse, one step out of the gate, had a heart attack, died. Oh, my gosh. Another time, put it all on one horse, like... Not even around the circle. Broke its leg. They came out and shot it right there. It's like, oh, no. all right. We're eating peanut butter sandwiches this week for dinner. We recognize that as a form of slavery. It's, you know, because it's so, it's, it's, it's over. But we were all slaves to sin. It just may not be like that. You know, all of us, it says in James that, you know, when our hearts draw us away, sin arises from within us, and we all lust after different things. And those lusts draw us to that, and when we give into it, we sin. And it says sin leads to death. That's what it wants to do. It wants to kill us. We're all not enslaved necessarily to the same types of sin. But we all have those things in our life that when it calls our name, we answer. We may fight it for a little while, but it's funny how light brings you around to those same mistakes. Same trials, and we give in. Jesus is saying that that is slavery. Now, because we're enslaved to sin, we got another master too, and it's death. In Romans 5, 12 through 14, it says, Therefore, as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sins. He goes on to say, Death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Down in verse 21, it says, Sin reigned in death. So we had this two-headed monster, sin and the wages of sin, death. You know, the Bible says throughout the New Testament over and over again that those who are enslaved to death are enslaved by the fear of death, that we know it's coming and we can't escape it. So it's just like those Jews who were talking to Jesus, though, they didn't recognize that they were slaves. And the thing is, neither do we. No one's walking out there doesn't know Jesus being, I am enslaved to sin. I am enslaved to death. I have two masters, and when they call, I must go. Nobody walks around saying that. So, God introduced something else we learned. The law. The law of Moses is our tutor that leads us to Jesus. It teaches us that we need Jesus. And how does it teach us that? By showing us that we are enslaved. Instead of just having sin, now it says that's what sin looks like. And you go, well, I got that in my life. And the law says, well, don't do it anymore. Do this instead. So you're like, i got to start doing that. And then we become hamsters on this hamster wheel where we see what's in front of us and we want to get there. We're doing a whole lot of movement, but nothing's happening. We're spinning our tires. And the law, it says, imprisons us. We read that last week in chapter 3, that it shuts everyone up under sin. But we become enslaved to it. So now we have a three-headed monster. We have sin, we have death, and we even have the law, something that was given that was good, that will do good things for us, but that enslaves us nonetheless. So that is our lot, Paul says. That is our, our state, our slavery, our prison. We were all slaves. Now look at verse 4, though. So he says, while we were children, we were held in bondage. Verse 4, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son. So when the fullness of the time came, when the time was ripe. Now I like to imagine God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit up there in heaven. And the Father says, I have a plan. Gear up. We're going to rescue some people. We're going to free some people out of slavery. And we're going to bring them home. He says, listen, I have it all planned out. I have been planning this since the very first time 
They sinned. I have been revealing parts of the plan now, piecemeal, little by little, letting them know that help will come. For millennia now, I've given them hints and stories that foreshadow what we're about to do. He's like, I've made promises. I have taken oaths. And now I will fulfill them all. I will keep my word. It is time. That is what that means. It is time. Some of you are gardeners. Maybe you have a fruit tree. And then, you know, the first time that fruit ends up on the branch, you want to pluck it right away. But you know you can't because the timing's not right. Timing is everything. God says right here that now the time is right. And the first wave is sent forth. God sent forth his son. His mission was to infiltrate our world, to identify with us, and to do what we never could. To free us. And that's what Jesus did. In verse 4 it says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. So that means he took on flesh. He who was fully God became fully man. He lay aside the privilege of heaven and he became human. A man who would thirst, a man who would hunger, a man who would grow weary, a man who would feel pain, a man who would be mocked by people, disbelieved by people, betrayed by his friends, a man who would be tempted in every way just like we were. He hopped on our hamster wheel. Yeah, he never sinned. It says he was born of a woman and he was born under the law. That means that, and this is crazy to think about, that he put himself into the same slavery we were in. He put himself under the law. In Philippians 2 7, it literally says that he, though he was equal with God, he did not think that equality was something to be grasped. So what did he do? He emptied himself and was made in fashion as a man. But it also says that he took on the form of a bondservant. We put bondservant in the Bible because it sounds better than slave. But slave, bondservant, servant, there's only one word for it. It's all the same word. He's a slave. Jesus Christ became a slave. He entered into our slave camp and said, okay, I'm with you guys. I am here. And where we all failed, though, he won. What we could not beat, he conquered. He told the people there in the Gospels, he said, I have not come to hang the law, I have come to fulfill it. I'm going to keep it all. I'm going to get on this hamster wheel, and I'm going to run and run and run, and I'm going to catch whatever we're all chasing after. I'm going to do it. It says that he, who knew no sin, though, became sin for us. He was tempted like we are, yet he never sinned. He knew it not. He never broke a command. He kept the whole law. And then, though he owed nothing to sin, he beat it. Though he owed nothing to death, it couldn't claim him. Though he fulfilled all the law, he still went to the cross, became a curse for us, took our punishment. He did all of that. Our debt, our price, our punishment, he paid our ransom. What it says here, he paid our redemption price. It says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law. He bought our freedom. Which means he freed us from the law, thereby freeing us from sin and freeing us from death. Colossians 2.14 says that he took all of those decrees that were hostile to us, the debt that we owed, and he canceled them all out by nailing them to the cross. But of course he was the price, for he was the one nailed to the cross. Now for so many of us, that is where the gospel ends. And it's an amazing story. Here we are, slaves. Jesus comes down, becomes one of us, takes on all of our sin, dies with it, raises us, raises from the dead, leaves our sin back there and says, all right, eternal light to all who believe. And we go, this is amazing. This is great. We don't have to be slaves anymore. We're free. And for so many Christians, it's like a jailbreak, right? That Jesus opens up those prison doors and we all run out of it. And well, we don't know where to run. We're free in this new world. But where do we go? We are no longer in fear of death. Oh man, we're free from the slavery of sin. This is great. We no longer are obligated to keep the whole law that's done. Oh, Jesus and our God, he is our Savior. He is our Lord. This is awesome. But the question is, is there anything more than that though? For many Christians who don't grasp the full understanding of the gospel, that's it. And that's the story. But there is more to the gospel than that. 
His plan was not simply to free us. No. Can you imagine for a moment if you were in crushing debt? Crushing, crushing debt. And it was the old days, so you were about to be sent to debtor's prison. And you were sent to debtor's prison. You know, we did away with that these days, at least in our country, because debtor's prison was something kind of crazy, right? You owed a debt you couldn't pay. They sent you to a prison until you paid it off. But you can't make any money in prison. So it was a life sentence. And I was just reading a book on the revolution. You know, they're, they're debtor's prison. They stick them on ships and let them sit in the ocean. And that was their life. Unless someone in your family or a friend would come in and they'd pay the debt for you. And we know that that's what Jesus did. Now imagine you're in one of those prisons and there's no escape. And out of the blue, the richest man on earth comes in and says, okay, I'm going to pay your debt. That would be completely and utterly amazing. <coughs> If they made a movie about that, we would say, wow, that's a way to spend your money, man. Charity. Freeing people. We could hope that we would one day be in that position. That would be great. But then imagine if then that man looked at you, sitting there in that prison, and he says, not only do I want to free you, but listen, I want to take you into my home, and I want to make you my heir. I want to make you the one who will inherit all of my wealth. If that wasn't a movie, you know what we'd say? Too far. The writers went too far. That's not going to happen. We don't even dare to dream that that would happen. Elon Musk is not going to come up and pay. Well, I don't know if he's the richest man anywhere, but, you know, imagine this was a month ago, right? He, uh, he's not going to come in, pay off all of our debt, and then say, not only that, but you know what? I'm going to make you, I'm bringing you into my house. And when I die, you're getting it all. You're getting it all. You can use it now. Here's a credit card. We'd say, okay. No, that's not going to happen. We'd say, well, what do you want? You want to give me a job? No, I don't want to give you a job. I just want to give you everything. Well, you want me to do something? No, I don't want you to do anything. I just want to give you everything. Come on. Well, okay. Look what Paul says here. It's not just that we're redeemed and freed from slavery. In verse 5, so that he might redeem those who are under the law. But why were we set free? He says that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus did not come to make slaves free. He was set to make slaves sons. Now, it's hard for us to understand the full weight of this, okay? Because in our world today, in our culture, adoption is a big deal. It is. It's a huge deal. But in Roman culture, it is a greater deal. We're separated from this context by so many years. But listen, in Roman times, if you had a biological son or daughter, okay, they had no rights. They had no rights as heirs. They had no rights to your wealth. You had no legal obligation to give your biological children anything. In fact, legally, you could disinherit them, disavow them, or disown them if they did something you didn't like. And there was, that was legal. A biological son was promised nothing. Now here's where things get interesting. In the Roman world, though, you could adopt somebody. Usually, adults were adopted. And when you were adopted, chosen by a man, a father, to adopt you, in Roman law, you could never disinherit that guy or that woman. You could never disavow them. You could never disown them. If you adopted someone, they were officially, legally, forever in your will. You were choosing them not just to be a child, but to be the inheritor of all that you own. That is what adoption meant in Roman times. That's why these wealthy men, like Julius Caesar, he had some children. He had some illegitimate children with some of his mistresses. He chose to adopt a man named Octavian. When he died, who became Caesar Augustus? It wasn't his biological children. They had no rights to the throne. Octavian became Caesar Augustus because he was adopted. He was the one who had the full rights as a son. Now, this is interesting because in the, when Jesus was speaking to the Jews, what did he say? He says, you must be born again. You must be born again. That's what he told Nicodemus. Because in the Jewish world, adoption was nothing. There was no concept of adoption in the Old Testament. Fathers could not disavow and disown their children. In fact, look at the prodigal son. He comes back to the dad, and the dad accepts him back. He forgives him. That's what Jewish men were supposed to do. <coughs> it wasn't like that in the Roman world. So Paul doesn't use that metaphor to explain what happened to these Greeks and Romans in Galatia. He uses what was greater for them. Adoption. 
John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. The gospel, God is offering us full rights and privileges of sonship. That is what Jesus offers. And unlike that older brother, you know, in the story of the prodigal son who hated that younger brother, who was mad he came back, who looked at the father and says, he's taking my inheritance. Hebrews 2.11, speaking of Jesus, says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Isn't that an amazing thing? Jesus, Christ our Lord, Christ our Savior, is Christ our brother. He came in to pay the price for our freedom and then says, Now I'm going to bring you back and you're my brethren now. You're my sister now. We are one family now. My father's going to adopt you. And I'm not ashamed to call you my brother. I'm not ashamed to call you my sister. I'm not ashamed to say that you are part of my family. Now that's crazy, right? Because every family's got a couple black sheep. You know, you say, yeah, we share a last name, but that's about it. You know, you ever meet someone? I go, hey, I saw your brother. Okay, um, don't judge me by him. You know, I just met them. Don't, hey, you, you met my dad? Okay, listen, we're a little different, okay? Um, we have those people in our lives, but Jesus is like, look, you're part of the family. I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed to call you family. In fact, I'm the one who made you family. Now, that's amazing. But there's a, a second wave that God sends. Our rescue team is not made up of just the Father and the Son. There's a third person. So look at the next verse here. It says, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. Now look at verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. God has sent forth not just the Son, but the Spirit. He sent forth the Son into the world, but now He has sent forth the Spirit into our hearts. In Romans 8, Paul calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of adoption. In Ephesians 1, he calls the Holy Spirit our seal, the pledge of our inheritance. Jesus himself said in John 14, he said, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because he abides in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Do you see that the, son, the Spirit is associated with sonship? You are not an orphan. Jesus did not just free you. The Spirit of the Son was sent into your heart as a seal a guarantee. 2 Corinthians says that a down payment of what we will receive from God. That's an amazing thing. This was the Father's plan. Jesus is sent to redeem us. The Spirit is sent to claim us. The Son was sent to free us. The Spirit leads us home. What the Son makes possible, the Spirit makes personal in your heart. And the Spirit, as He sends, as he sends into our hearts, what does He do? He cries out, Abba, Father. That is Father. Father. Abba is Hebrew for Father. He starts right away say, Father, Father. Listen, in Romans 8, right, Paul says, we don't even know how to pray like we should, but the Spirit himself helps us. He intercedes for us. He prays for us with groanings we can't hear. It's a wonderful thought to think that when the Spirit of the Son enters our hearts and we don't even know how to pray, we don't know how to approach God, we don't know anything yet, one of the Spirit's first prayers, the first word he says is what? Father. Imagine for a moment if you were that slave who was adopted and you became a son. I, I ask, okay, you're adopted now. Would you feel comfortable going to that man who adopted you and calling him dad? That'd probably be pretty uncomfortable, right? You know, you go up there, maybe he's got his biological children, they're like, dad, dad, father, father. Would you feel like just jumping in the mix and be like, father? No, you'd be afraid. He'd look at you and be like, okay. You probably wonder in your heart how he would respond the first time you say something like that. You know, I wonder if the family was all getting ready. They're sitting down to eat dinner. Would you just run up and sit down at the table and be like, all right, what's for dinner? Or would you kind of stand aloof a little bit and kind of wait to be invited because you're not sure? 
of where you should sit. You're not sure of, of how they do things. You're not sure if like you're fully accepted yet. Are you a slave or are you a son? Can I go in there? So you'd wait. You know, I wonder if uh, you would feel the confidence to approach your father at any moment of any day. You know, I remember one day, this is kind of bad, but I was walking through my neighbor's house. They had six kids. Parents were always working. So, well, I love to be there. <laughs> you know, it was just a, a big, chaotic, awesome kid house. <laughs> and I remember one time I was walking out the door to go home, and there was an open pack of Oreos on the stove. And I grabbed a couple Oreos, and I shoved them in my mouth. And the big brother, who was not my friend, he says, David, did you just eat our Oreos? And I'm like, no, I did not. It was a lie. And he began to chase me. And oh my goodness, I ran out of that house as fast as I could. I never knew I could run so fast. I was like Sonic the Hedgehog. I go through the front yard, and all of a sudden my dad is out in the front yard, and my dad ran his business out of our home. He works on, you know, uh, marine outboard engines. He works on boats. And there he was talking to a customer. We had a rule. Don't, don't interrupt dad when he's talking to customers. You can't do that. It's unprofessional. Do you think I waited in that moment to be like, excuse me? No. I screamed as soon as I saw him, Dad! And then the bully stopped running. Okay. And he backed off. Dad, I ran up to him and grabbed his leg. I could care less who he was talking to. I had that confidence. But I ask you, if he had just adopted me, would I feel that confidence? Would I feel confident to go to my father if he's watching his favorite TV show and say, hey, Dad, I got a question? No, you'd be afraid of him saying, come back later. I wonder if you'd be bold, if you were a slave and now you're a son, to go up and ask that dad for anything freely. Not say, can I borrow some money? Not to say, you know, can I, can I do some chores and earn some money? But to say, dad, can I have $20 right now? Free, no strings attached. Can I have that? No, we would not have that confidence. You know, and what about when you messed up and you did something you know, you know was bad? And he would not approve. What would you do then? Would you run to him or would you run away from him? Would you pack up your bags and say, well, this is fun. It's been a good day. I'm out of here. We gave it a shot. You see, the father foresaw that we would have all of these doubts. He knew we would have all of these difficulties. He knew that just making it so that we are children, we needed something more here. Us, we needed help. So he sends the spirit into our hearts, the spirit of his son. And he teaches us what it means to be a son. And he starts with looking to God and says, Father... A word that we may not feel that we could say, Father, Father. You know, when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he starts out with our Father. Our Father, not my Father. He says, our Father. And I wonder what the disciples first thought when they heard that. Our Father? We can call him Lord God. We can call him Lord, creator of the universe, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we're going to claim him as our Father? I don't know. The Holy Spirit helps us. Romans 8.15 says, You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You have received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. You see that verse? The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit comes into our hearts and he begins by crying out, Abba, Father. And he begins a work in our hearts so that we too will look to God and cry out, Abba, Father. You know, everyone wants the Spirit's work in our life to be miraculous and big. We want to do some miracles, you know, like Elijah. You know, we want to be able to belt out some amazing, inspired psalm under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit like David. We want to do some healings, you know, like Peter and Paul. We want to do all these things. We want to shout out in tongues and everyone understand us. We want the miraculous work of the Spirit. But what Paul tells us is what is the everyday work of the Spirit? The Spirit that he says is at work in every single child of God. It is this inner work that is convincing us that we really are children and that he really is our Father. So you want to talk about who is most spiritual? It is those who fully accept and understand and believe that they are a son or daughter of God. And when they look to God, they can say, Father, and mean it, and believe it, and accept it. That is what spiritual maturity looks like. The Galatians are messing everything up. They think spiritual maturity is following closer and closer to the law. Works, works, works. And Paul says, you've got it all wrong. All of it wrong. You've messed up the whole plan, the whole story. You've thrown out that book and replaced it with another book. I'm telling you the story is you are a child of God. And the Spirit is working in you right now, crying out, Abba, Father. And in Romans, he says, and one day you too will cry out, Abba, Father, because of his work in your heart. 
So he works in us to accept who God is to us and who we are to God. God is our Father, a Father who chose you. There are no accidental adoptions. He chose you. A Father who chose to rescue you. A Father who adopted you, who granted you full rights as sons and daughters. A Father who brought you into His family, wrote you into His will. A Father who loves you. And you are His child. You have been claimed by Him. You have been given everything He has. You are no longer a slave. You are not your past. You are not your sin. You are not who you used to be. Your identity is not based on your current performance either, and it's not based on how good you're going to do tomorrow. You are his child, adopted, no take-backs. No option to be disavowed. No option to be disowned. No option to be forsaken. No option to be forgotten. These people who tell you, you got to do good or you'll lose it, Paul would say, I wrote a book about that. You are a child of God, and it's illegal to disown someone you adopt. You are sealed. You are promised. It's done. Now, I question you now, is that how you think of God? <coughs> and is that how you think of yourself? Can you run to God any time, any place, no matter where you are and what you've done, no matter who is chasing you out of the house, can you scream, Father? Can you ask Him for anything, believing that He wants you to, and that He is for you, and that nothing will separate you from Him any longer, that nothing will separate you from His love? If you still struggle with a works-based acceptance or a performance-based spiritual walk, a law-based life, then you are still struggling with understanding the full truth of the gospel. You are still struggling with understanding who God really is and who He wants to be in your life, who He chose you to be to Him. He wants you to look to Him as Father. When a slave, when that slave, right, that finally believes in his heart, that he is a child of this Father. When he finally ushers up the courage and confidence and boldness to look to that Father and call him Father, not just from tradition, not just because he heard other people doing it, because in his heart of hearts he has accepted it, when he does that, he doesn't find a Father who twists his head and looks at him weird. He finds a Father rejoicing. Can I just tell you something? This week... I was doing something on the couch. It was time for the kids to go to bed. So Finn comes out, and he runs, and he gives me a hug. He goes, I love you, Dad. I'm like, good night, buddy. I love you, too. And then Fisher comes out. He gives me a hug. He says, I love you, Dad. I said, I love you, too, buddy. Go to sleep. And then Sky came out. First time ever. She waddles on out there, and she, like, you know, moved her mouth, like, puckered up to give me a kiss. So I reached down, and I gave little Sky a kiss. And I thought that was it. She, you know, she talks little words. I swear, she said, I love you, Daddy. I looked at her and I said, say that again. <laughs> I have never felt in my entire life anything like I felt in that moment. I can't explain it. And I thought to myself, because this past was in my mind, I said, you know what? I can only imagine what the Father must feel. When we get to that place in our faith and in our life, when we can look to Him and from a pure heart, a fully believing heart, look to Him and say, Father, I love you, Father. If your theology is not built on that truth, like the Galatians, you will always struggle. You will struggle with what the gospel truly means. You will struggle with legalism. You will struggle with religion. You will never really fully understand what makes Christianity so much different than everything else. You will never fully grasp the truth that God is and what he's done for us. But you don't have to struggle any longer. You can come to his table. You can come to his throne. You can come to him as you are and call him Father. You can rest in that freedom. You can rest in that love. You can rest in that security knowing that he has adopted you. Christ, our brother, has made it so. And the Holy Spirit is inside of us working to get us to that very point. It's an amazing thing. Let's pray. Father, Father, we love you. Lord, I pray for everyone in here. Lord, if they don't know you yet, if they don't know your son, if they are still trusting in themselves, enslaved to sin and death and the law, please, Lord, work in their heart to let them realize that freedom is waiting for them. That they can walk out of those prison doors and be adopted into your glorious family. Lord, some here have struggled with fatherhood. Perhaps their fathers weren't that great. Perhaps they have failed in their own life as that. 
and saying, Father, is a weird thing. May they be comforted knowing that you, Lord, are a good Father. That where we fail, you, you don't. Lord, if there are Christians in here that struggle with understanding the truth of your gospel, the full weight and power of what it means to be adopted, please open their eyes to the truth of your word so that all of us together can enjoy being your children, can enjoy looking to you as Father, and that we can enjoy and rest and live free in all the rights and benefits that you've given to us as your children. We love you, Father. Thank you that we are a family, a church family, sharing one Father. We love you. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen.